Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. You join me here in the English countryside, although uh, most of this video takes place in London. And I thought for the end of the year video, why not discuss my favorite watch? And that is my wristwatch check. It is back on the Phoenix Mil Spec NATO strap. In fact, actually, I cut the NATO strap made it into a one piece. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. I thought I'd discuss, yeah, three years. This has been, you know, this nonstop love affair with the Explorer. Um, so I thought I'd kind of revisit the watch. Let's go through a little bit of history and uh, explore London. Now I did do 24 hours in London video. I think it was it last year or perhaps the year before topping up with tea at Fortnum's, dinner at uh, incredible restaurants in the Shard, this kind of thing, uh, museums, all the rest of it. Uh, but today I thought as we are discussing the Explorer, a, a watch that is inextricably linked, not only in my mind to London, but Ian Fleming as well. I thought I'd um, visit Florence, my favorite perfumery in the world, uh, family tradition. When I first got into watches, I always disregarded the Explorer. It's perhaps a little too kind of understated, uh, even boring, but then charm, the heritage, the story, the, the Ian Fleming connection, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, just appealed to me. But beyond that, also my own grandfather, you may have seen him in pretty much every single other intro of my channel. He's a role model for me intellectually, uh, as, a, as a gentleman, how to behave, how to dress. And he used to frequent a lot of the places you're about to see in London uh, that I visited, because I often think, what would my grandfather wear? And I, I honestly think he'd wear an explorer if he was alive today. It's very much him, it's that understated, classic British, refined, but the better side of Rolex, you know. But then again, sometimes I like a little bit of flashiness and that, that's why I have the day date and all the rest of it. He had his townhouse and office on Bolton Street and he'd pop down to St. James's to the Carlton Club uh, and then he'd go to German Street to, you know, Turnbull and Asser, Lock and Co. I still have some of his Lock and Co caps, which I actually even wear. Um, all these old British institutions, Savile Row, of course, is only around the corner, Bond Street, and the Burlington Arcade, which I have to say is very watch-centric. If you've ever uh, visited, there's a lot of watch stores. Unfortunately, I couldn't really film in there. I saw everything from vintage Big Crown subs to 806 Navi timers, you name it, fantastic stuff. So without further ado, let's check out the history of the Explorer and some of the sights of London uh, that are very close to my heart. The Explorer started its legacy not as the Explorer as we know it, but a customised oyster perpetual. Long before Sir Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay conquered Everest, the forefathers of the Explorer was the result of 20 years of research in extreme conditions. Rolex started sending watches on Himalayan expeditions back in the 30s, with the aim of creating the ultimate mountaineer's tool watch that could survive the roughest conditions, as well as keep perfect time at extreme cold temperatures with 70% less oxygen than at sea level. Rolex then went on to sponsor both historic expeditions of Hillary and Tenzing in 1952 and then in 1953, only one being permitted each year by the Nepalese government. After the success of the latter in 53, Rolex decided to commemorate this momentous achievement of reaching the summit by renaming the specially adapted Oyster Perpetual into the Explorer later that same year. Mercedes hands were added, as well as a highly legible and gracefully balanced 369 numeral layout. This would subtly evolve over the following decades from gilt to silver, as well as the calibers being upgraded inside. The early vintage references 6160 and 6610 then gave way to perhaps the most desired by collectors, the definitive 1016. This was made even more legendary by becoming the watch of choice by Ian Fleming. The James Bond creator and writer has been pictured many times sporting it and has become the only watch ever to be mentioned in his novels. While he never directly named it as the Explorer model, he did describe it as a Rolex Oyster Perpetual. And as the 1016 was his daily timepiece during that period, it leads many to believe that the Rolex Explorer was in fact actually the real James Bond watch. 
The 1016 was undoubtedly one of the most influential steps in the transformation of the Explorer in becoming one of the best Rolexes ever made. The water resistance became 100 meters, which still remains the rating to this day. The Caliber 1570 gave it the hacking feature, and also the entirely brushed Oyster bracelet was significantly upgraded too. This became one of the longest running references, being superseded by the precursor to my reference, which was of course the 14 270 that debuted at the end of the 1980s. This replaced the previous acrylic crystal with scratch proof sapphire, a much more modern approach with applied indices of 18 karat white gold. It also opted for a lacquer dial rather than the previous matte one and super luminova for the rest of the applied markers and hands. Powering the 14270 is the caliber 3000 that was then replaced in 2001 with the current caliber in my particular reference, the caliber 3130. Look where I am guys, Buckingham Palace. Okay, so uh, I've just gone into Fortnum's, topped up my yearly supplies. There, you see, they got a really cool advent calendar on the windows. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to film in there, but I did sneak my camera in last year, so you get to see uh, what it's like in there. But if you come to London, you've got to go to Fortnum's. We're on German Street, now we're gonna go to Floris. Behind the camera is Fortnum's. Oh, there's Crockett and Jones we just passed. As you guys know, I love Crockett and Jones. It's all the staples of James Bond. Um, so now we're gonna go and talk to Florence. Historic perfumery. I think they date back till about the 17th century or something like that. Anyway, we're gonna get the whole, the whole bit of history, all of it. Um, so yeah, let's have a look inside. We are inside the florist store and we're joined by Edward. How are you, sir? Very well, thanks. How are you? I'm very well. Well, I'm very happy to be here. I haven't been here since I was a child. Um, well, I'm pleased to, that you could come today. Well, I, I do um, remember this carpet, which is strange. Yes, we did have, we've had gone through a few different carpets in, in, the, in the, the, over the years. But right. uh, yeah, this was, this is um, one that's been in here for a long time, actually. But in the shop, we've got the, the wooden flooring now. So and the, 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 the few changes. Is, it's all been renovated and... Uh, just, yeah, very um, uh, sort of sensitive sensitively uh, right. uh, renovated, yeah, so just because we have our, all the uh, cabinets in, in there are from the uh, Great Exhibition in 1851, wow. so we really wanted to slightly update the, the shop, but in a very sensitive way to, to, right. be, to respect the heritage of the shop as of well. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned heritage because we should explain, it was founded in 17... 1730. Wow, so it's, it's one, is it the oldest? It's um, one of the oldest, isn't it? We're the oldest, certainly in... Um, in uh, Great Britain, right, um, and um, uh, one of the oldest independent perfumeries in, in the world. That's extraordinary. That's I, I know for a fact my family's been going here. I mean, my mother took me. That's when I remembered the carpet. Was I used to come in here? My mum used to take me. I used to get the little free samples. She would come in, get the personalised, the customised perfumes. Brilliant. Yeah, it's it's That's quite brilliant. surreal to be back here. Mm. Um, so sort of memories. Yeah. Know, Especially some of the fragrances, I'm sure we still yes. we still make, so that would bring back even more. Yeah, memories. of course, because yeah. smell is the most it triggers off memories yeah, more really than anything else. So uh, it's, it's, you know that sort of instant no nostalgia that yeah. you have when you smell something. Yeah, and I've got to say because I, I you see I review watches, and um, I found out a little bit later that the number eighty nine, which happens to be my favourite, is also not only the number of the the building that's original, right? That it's the yeah, so it was. Um, it's a fragrance that was created in um, uh, 1951 by right. my grandfather, actually. Oh, really? Uh, yes, and uh, it's um, it's named after the, the number of the, the shop in Germany. Right. It used to be the um, the family home, actually. So um, sure. Um, 
all of our offices upstairs. Um, they still got the old fireplaces in, and uh, so yes, it used to wow. be a family home. So very much still the, the, the home and the heart of, of Flores. Forgive me for asking, but how many generations? Uh, I'm part of the ninth generation now. That's that's amazing. You must be so proud. Oh yeah, it's a, it's great. Uh, it's a great honour to be able to continue the, the family tradition and and uh, be a custodian of the, the brand for future generations. Right. Really. And to look after all these fragrances that my ancestors have created over the years and um, and have the, the opportunity to add to those with, with our new inspirations and, and uh, oh, that's ideas. So, that is so cool. So the 89 also, it was Church, Churchill's favourite wasn't it? Or? Uh, it was actually um, uh, Ian Fleming's. That's right, of course, because yes. I'm, I'm actually wearing the Explorer which kind of ties it, it's my excuse to be here basically, oh, because he had yeah, this yeah. watch, well, an earlier version of this watch. So how is the Bond franchise, I would imagine it's got a, a lot more traction with the, with the fragrance? Um, well, we, we mentioned in a few of the, the uh, books, the James right. Bond books, so um, we do have a lot of customers that come in um, and you know read about us uh, through the books, right. which is really nice. Ian Fleming used to come here when my grandfather was here, and, and um, so that, oh, that's wow. quite, um, yeah, amazing, But because uh, I think he used to live nearby and used to go to Duke's Hotel Bar, and uh -huh. I used to sort of uh, so he's in the area. So who would you who would you <coughs> say is the 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 most um, uh, influential in terms of that really uh, a customer that really changed the brand or, or put the brand on the on the map so to speak? Because you you have a lot of royal warrants. Yes, we, over the years we've had. Um, so the first royal warrant was in eighteen hundred, and we've had seventeen since then. And now we. Oh the only appointed perfumer to the Queen, and we hold a, a warrant to the Prince of Wales as well. Wow, that's extraordinary. Um, we've had so many different customers really over the years. It's it's hard to sort of pick pick one. You know, Winston Churchill was a customer. Right. And, um, when they made <clears throat> the Darkest Hour, um, uh, Gary Oldman's uh, he, he's very much a sort of method actor. And yes. He heard that he wore our fragrance, so he asked his assistant if she could get the fragrance because so, right. he wanted to wear it on set. Extraordinary. And, so he could sort of really get into the, the character. That, of, that's that's so Gary Oldman. Yeah, totally. My friend who runs, um, it's a family business, a family tailors in, in Savile Row, he, mm -hmm. uh, he was flown out to um, Los Angeles to, to fit because uh, he used to get all his suits from um, Henry Bull and so he went out there to, to fit Gary Oldman and he said the whole time he was in character, you know, sort of chomping on the cigar. Amazing. And he said it was a very strange experience. Yeah, so he, 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 would, he was smelling of florists, uh, Savaro suited, amazing. Mm. I didn't really realise that, how, him, the, the, how much history there was. And for me, it's been family tradition. But I'm all, I'm happy that in a way I can kind of support British brands, especially one with such a rich legacy. What is your personal favourite achievement that that really makes you the proudest of the brand? Um, well, so so many. I mean, all, all the the fragrances that that I've worked on and right. been involved in. When you talk to customers and, and hear, you know, if somebody says, "Oh, that's my favourite fragrance," and nice. so you know that. It's someone that you've created or you've had a part in creating. That's what really makes you the happiest. Definitely, yeah. That's, that's cool. Great, yeah. Um, well, I think we'll wrap it up there, but thank you so much. It's oh, been a, it's an it's absolute, absolute honour to, to meet you. you. Yeah, me too. It's crazy thank to be here. Thank you for coming. That's a pleasure. So I apologise about the unglamorous uh, light. I just came back from Burlington Arcade. Behind me actually is the Savoy. If you remember, I had breakfast, or was it lunch last year, in uh, last year's 24 hours in London. Went up St. James's Street, old haunts of the family. If you're not familiar with the Explorer, let's just go over uh, the specifications in a kind of mini review of this beloved reference of mine. So here we are in the sweet spot of the Explorer range before being eventually made larger in 39mm in 2010. This is the 36mm automatic reference 114270. Still is one of the most accessible in terms of price and prestige when it comes to considering buying a famous Rolex icon. It's extremely slender at only 10.5 millimeters in height and 44 millimeters 
from lug to lug. Wonderfully discreet and almost compatible with any wrist. And for those with the larger wrist, there is of course the later 39mm. The unmistakable orientation is assisted by the superluminova triangle. While we do not have loomed numerals like the most recent versions, the clarity and effectiveness of the dial is still outstanding. This is one of the most well-proportioned uh, dial layouts of all time. One that has been imitated endlessly. So successful, in fact, when people talk about similar dial layouts, they often refer to it as a explorer-style layout. These all-gold markers uh, have the added advantage of being more legible in normal light, as they tend to glimmer and shine with a cleverly deliberate high-polish finish. And talking of high-polish, so is the bezel, the case sides and the screw down crown. The tops of the curved lugs that hug the wrist beautifully are in a brushed directional finish. The bezel itself frames the flat sapphire glass there. These highly reflective mirror finished surfaces elevate the watch to a somewhat more luxurious dignified look. Over the typical utilitarian all brushed field watches, the Explorer would compete with. Inside, the in-house manufactured caliber 3130 gives you a chronometer certified accuracy. Manual wind is of course included. We have the classic 28,800 vibrations an hour uh, with the smooth Rolex sweep, a healthy power reserve of 48 hours and 31 joules. It is fitted with a parachrome hairspring, offering greater resistance to shocks, magnetism and temperature variations. Its architecture is in common with all Oyster watch movements and makes it highly reliable. It not having a date and any extra complications decreases the chance of more things going wrong essentially, uh, which is very in keeping with the essence of the first prototype explorers before the name even appeared on the dial and the legends of mountains were achieved. The absence of a date naturally negates the need for a Cyclops magnifier, making it a less obvious Rolex, therefore without the stigma sometimes attached to its more ostentatious offerings. But also, the main advantage is that beautifully symmetrical cleaner dial. However, simultaneously, we must mention this is still a Rolex, and therefore all the inherent true luxury quality, the heritage, and value retention is there. So no matter what sticky situation you get into, you can always get out of it, just like James Bond. Normally, with most explorers on sale at Watchbox, it would come with one of the best bracelets Rolex has ever made. It is, of course, the entirely brushed, tool-like, no-nonsense Oyster bracelet, with solid 20mm end links, micro-adjustments, an Oyster lock clasp, and tapered screwed links. They are solid, dependable, and so quintessentially Rolex. However, that said, one of the things I do adore about this more contemporary Explorer is the fact you can literally pair it with anything. A true strap monster. And what accentuates this point is the simple black, silver, and white color scheme, uh, which makes it lend itself to any attire, virtually any strap. And at the same time, its robust, uncomplicated mechanical efficiency means it can also deal with any situation that life may throw at it. This is without a shadow of a doubt why this has become known as the do-it-all perfect everyday Rolex. Coupled with its unpretentious, understated elegance, this makes collecting watches almost seem redundant. It is highly ironic for me that I overlooked this watch for so many years, considering it a little bit too simple. But, as I've described in many videos, it has a slow release charm, and this makes it one of the most lovable offerings from the brand. In many ways, more faithful to the real core strengths of the original intentions of what Hans Wilsdorf wanted Rolex to be all about. Before, the brand, of course, became the aspirational status symbol that everybody wants. This, in many ways, you could say, is the connoisseur's Rolex, if you will. It remains one of the greatest and most versatile Rolex watches ever made, in my opinion. The best of the brand, without the superfluous fluff, and also one of the classiest too, inextricably linked to British culture, history, and accomplishment. Ultimately, if it really came down to it, and God forbid, I could only choose one watch 
this would be unquestionably it. So predictions for 2020. Well, Basel World is just around the corner. I'd love to see a return of the albino. I think it was in about the 60s. I have always lusted after 1016. I find myself kind of, I don't know. I'm, I, obviously, I'd love to, if I had bags of money, if I was, um, you know, ducktails rich, I would buy one in a heartbeat. But uh, they are kind of overpriced for what they are. I understand the desire, the collectability is there. However, I, I'm just not comfortable paying that kind of prices. There's so many other watches I would love to experience. But, and also, I'm, I'm very content with this. And talking of the 1016, I'd love to see a return to perhaps the matte dial. Uh, like the 1016, maybe even a modern explorer with a gilt matte dial. That would be really, really cool. Love to hear your suggestions or predictions rather of what you think um, if Rolex are ever going to do um, something new with the Explorer. I mean, they have to, it's inevitable. Maybe not this next year or the year after. And walking around London, I really realized how many people are what seem to be more into watches there than elsewhere, much more than New York, uh, surprisingly. I spotted so many Submariners and Speedmasters, even several SKXs on people's wrists, and I had to really st stop myself from um, you know, well, maybe I, sh I should have just complimented the whole lovely S SKX, you know, even modded ones. I couldn't believe it. So obviously there are much more watch enthusiasts in London. I, d I don't know if that's official, but what do you guys think? Do you think there's a more of a, a kind of interest in, in watches uh, in general there? Or yeah, do, do let me know in, in the comments. Okay, guys, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, what an incredible year, so much more to come. I want to wish everybody a happy holidays, no matter what you celebrate, it is a time to be with your family and loved ones. Uh, so I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for watching the channel over the year. I've uh, got some extremely exciting stuff in the pipeline. I'm not going to say too much, but just stay tuned. I will see you in the new year uh, with a ton more reviews sky's the limit and thanks to watchbox and everybody my, my team of course uh, everybody that supports me there's just too many of you um, so thank you to everyone from the bottom of my heart in terms of this particular video i well i'd love to hear your predictions for the explorer and also what is your favorite watch if you could pick one favorite watch what would it be uh, it's difficult right especially us watch obsessives thank you so much for watching please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful and i will catch you in 2020 crazy right who would have imagined it oh well there we go ciao